The lecture on child health is divided into five more specific themes. Why does child health matter? How do we measure child health? What are the social determinants of child health? And what does this mean? This is a stock taking point in the lecture where we reflect on all we know and what we don't know. And then lastly, we will cover what we can do, what interventions are cost effective and affordable, and what we should advocate for if we want to improve child health. It makes sense to start with a simple definition of child health. Often, in practice, child health measures are negatively defined and narrowly defined, amounting to little more than assessing survival and absence of the illness. This practice is largely due to measurement issues, as it is more difficult to summarize and capture the various aspects of health in one measure. This is an important question to consider because how we measure child health will affect how we operationalize research questions regarding health and ultimately how we view health. So it is important to bear in mind that health is defined as a positive and encompassing concept. And according to the World Health Organization's definition, WHO's, child health is a state of physical, mental, intellectual, social, and emotional well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Accordingly, it's important to take note that there is a large overlap between the definition of child health and child development. But let us return to the question at hand. Why does child health matter? It matters first and foremost because child health is a basic right and because avoidable deaths are inherently wrong. In 2019, there were 6.1 million children and young adolescents who died, and most of these were preventable deaths. 5.2 million of these deaths were children under the age of 5, and nearly half of the children under 5 who died were newborn babies. And just to put, this, and just to put these numbers in perspective, Every six seconds, a child under the age of five dies somewhere in the world. Here's a graph of the under five mortality rate for several regions in developing countries using World Bank data. The under five mortality rate shows the number of children under five who have died per 1,000 live births. The countries in orange are the developed countries and bars in gray represent regions. What is very clear from this is that, again, the African countries have far higher child mortality rates. If I were born in Switzerland, there would be a 4 in 1,000 chance of me dying before the age of 5. This is in quite stark contrast with a place like Angola or the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the DRC, where we have four times higher likelihood of dying before the age of 5 where 91 or 81 children out of 1,000 live births die before their fifth birthday. This graph puts the inequality in life chances and living conditions in perspective. I also wanted to look at immunization coverage to avoid showing child health only according to a negative and narrow definition. This graph looks at the same set of countries using only World Bank data. It compares immunization coverage for measles, expressed as a share of children from 12 to 23 months of age who have had a measles vaccination. We find a strong adherence to vaccination coverage with most countries having achieved 90% coverage, but African countries are disappointing with much lower levels of coverage. The DRC is below 60%, and Angola is even lower at 42%, which again gives a vivid picture of the inequalities in the lives and morbidity experiences of children in different country contexts. This brings global health and equality into focus. Child health matters because it is a right and because of social justice, but it also matters because of economic references to a term that is often used in the literature to describe the enduring impact of child health. It is called the long arm of child health, which refers to the long-lived and strong correlation between childhood health and adult health and adult economic outcomes. When a child is healthy, they're more likely to be healthy as an adult. 
and more likely to have decent labor market returns as an adult. Conversely, children who are unhealthy and are unwell are more likely to be sick and unwell as adults, and more likely to have lower labor market returns or to be unemployed. Added to this is the fact that the literature has shown that the long-term effects of early life health shocks are likely to be more pronounced in developing countries. Why is this? Firstly, because shocks are more frequent and tend to be reoccurring events in developing countries. Secondly, because multiple problems can be reinforcing. For instance, it makes sense that a hungry and poorly nourished child will recover more slowly from illness than a well-nourished child. Furthermore, we know that there are fewer mitigation strategies and safety nets in developing countries that would allow those that have been hit by shock to recover, to get back up again. That is also why we believe grants are important, why universal health coverage is important, of course, when they are affordable. We know that child health does affect outcomes later in life. It does feed into a poverty trap and can be self-reinforcing and for that reason, we also worry about it. We care about this because we want a world that is more equitable and that is fair. For this reason, we want to make sure, especially for young children, that their future life is not determined by the lottery of being born to poor parents or rich parents. We don't want children to inherit a future. We want them to make and choose their future. We know that children who grow up in poor neighborhoods are often at a disadvantage already at a very, very early age. And that's also a finding that comes through strongly in the work of Janet Curry from Princeton. Her work and that of other researchers in this area clearly demonstrates the importance of the Barker hypothesis. According to epidemiologist David Barker's fetal programming hypothesis, nutrition in the prenatal period and observed via birth weight can have long-term health effects including obesity, diabetes, insulin insensitivity, hypertension, as well as coronary heart disease and stroke. The link with poverty is that poor mothers often struggle to provide a healthy fetal environment for the fetus to develop and to thrive as it should. This, however, is not all. Additionally, we know that babies with low birth weights have worse adult health and labor market outcomes. This, in turn, provides less optimal health conditions for children of these adults, which can create a self-perpetuating poverty cycle. This cycle of self-perpetuating poverty is depicted in the figure here. We see how poverty is likely to lead to an unhealthy fetal environment and subsequently cause low birth weight. This and other factors related to poverty will then cause poor childhood health. This impacts brain development and returns on education, which then adversely affects labor market outcomes, which in turn makes the individual more likely to be poor. And thus, there is an intergenerational transmission of poverty via this pathway. The theory on health investment borrows from financial market models. The flow diagram shown here is loosely based on the Grossman model, which is the most well-known model of investment in health. Here it has been tweaked slightly to focus on child health. So, at the top left corner, it shows that every child's health journey starts with maternal health and the fetal environment provided by the mother, which then determines the initial stock of health at birth. Then, further investments are made throughout the child's life. But these investments come at a cost, both financial and time costs, so they require sacrifices. From a poverty and equity perspective, the important element to note here is that some would be in a worse position to make these investments based on financial or time constraints. And these investments are made throughout your lifetime. The returns on these investments are determined by the education and information that an individual has which are further mechanisms whereby, for poor households and poor individuals, social disadvantage is perpetuated and may manifest as a lower yield in health investments. It is also important to note that health has an inherent value and that it is directly experienced by the individual and has direct utility, but it also has a value in terms of what we can do with it, what it enables indirectly. It enables productivity and labor market earnings. 
The interesting relationship to note here is that labor market earnings in turn determine the money that you have available to you to make investments in your health during your life. So there's an important sort of dependency here, which of course would mean that if you are unable to work due to poor health, you can end up in a type of low equilibrium trap where you are unable to invest in your own health to escape your poor health. This is exactly why we think it's important to have universal health coverage and health insurance. We now move on to consider how we assess whether a child has adequate health and whether they're sufficiently healthy. The starting point is to look at the sustainable development goals and health is addressed in the third goal called ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. The targets and also how we measure targets are interesting to us. Some of them relate to child health but not all. The ones that relate directly to child health are shown in orange on these slides. Those that relate indirectly to child health have been marked with a bright green. The second sub-goal is orange to end the preventable deaths of newborns and children under five years of age related directly to child health. Maternal mortality is marked as green because it relates indirectly to child health, both because maternal survival is so important for the child, but also because of the impact of the fetal environment on the health of the child. The other goals that are indirectly important to child health are the prevention and treatment of substance abuse universal access to reproductive health services, and then finally, reducing the number of deaths and illnesses from toxins and chemicals. We'll pay more attention to this throughout the lecture. It is a very important mechanism for equitable differences in child health, because often it's the poor who can't protect themselves from toxins and chemicals, and poor families who end up living next to the factories that emit harmful pollution. For a child health measurement, we start with distinguishing three large categories, child mortality, health conditions, and functional status. In the literature on childhood, the theme of mortality dominates because it's such a readily available variable and we all care about it and understand what it means. Examples include neonatal mortality and under five years of age mortality. Also, surveys often have information on health conditions that will include self-reported diseases, injuries, and symptoms. These might include diarrhea, asthma, diabetes, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, hearing impairments, and cerebral palsy. However, these self-reported measures are often plagued by a reporting bias, and what is most concerning is the under-reporting by the poorest and most vulnerable, most likely due to differences in preferences and thresholds. Because of this reporting heterogeneity, economists tend to prefer biomarkers because of the difficulty with self-reporting biases and the alignment of these biases with the dimensions of disadvantage and advantage that we are interested in. Child health biomarkers include low birth weight, BMI, and stunting. The third dimension of child health measurements is functional status, and that's used far less for children, but it is often included. For adults, these are questions about what you can do and can't do, and whether you can dress yourself, move around freely, or not. In terms of children, this would be what activities are children prevented from participating in because of their health problems. Over and above the usual problems with health measurements due to, for instance, self-reporting issues, child health measurements have additional difficulties. Most importantly, they are reliant on information from proxies. They wouldn't come directly from the children. They may come from adult caretakers, from parents, or from clinicians, because very young children cannot answer for themselves. Also, if the questions are quite abstract, then school-aged children would often not be able to answer for themselves either. It impedes comparability over time because the proxies might change. Or there may be comparability issues when the children become old enough to respond themselves and we need to compare answers with an earlier period when someone was responding on their behalf. Several surveys can be used to measure child health. 
The most frequently available ones are the demographic and health surveys. They track child survival and mortality, and also the weight and height of children. They are comparable across countries. There are also household surveys. They track survival and mortality, as well as child height and weight measurements, and reported illnesses and symptoms, usually by caregivers in the household. There are also data sets that have been designed to track child development and health over time with longitudinal or panel data. And while they may often not be a representative sample and tend to be rare, they are a rich and valuable source of data to complement what we learn from these other types of surveys that are more readily available and are representative. Finally, there are macro country level data which are available from organizations such as the WHO and the World Bank. The advantage of these data sets is often that they are comparable across countries. They would include data on mortality and immunizations, for example. As an example of how longitudinal data can be used to examine the relationship between child health outcomes and chronic household poverty, I will talk you through a recent study by Marissa von Fintel published in the Child Indicators Research. It used the three waves of the National Income Dynamics Study, NIDS, in South Africa, childhood health measures including stunting, wasting, and self-reported health. We will also look at two additional measures, namely access to immunization records and birth weights. The way that von Fintel approximates poverty is by using a multi-dimensional index including child mortality, years of schooling, school attendance, fuel for lighting, heating and cooking, access to clean water and adequate sanitation, type of house, ownership of a list of assets and unemployment. She classifies the bottom third as poor. She considers both poverty in one period and persistent or chronic poverty which is defined as being classified as poor in all three periods of the survey. As you can see from the wide gaps in the means and the lack of overlap in these confidence intervals, that she finds a strong and significant correlation between chronic poverty and height for age and stunting. We see, for instance, that stunting is the most likely and the most prevalent outcome in households that have consistent poverty and in households that experience multidimensional poverty across the three waves of the survey. Similarly, there are also large differences across group access to immunization cards and low birth weights. These differences are significant because the confidence intervals do not overlap. Children in chronically poor households are more likely not to have immunization cards and more likely to be born with low birth weights. While this work is a good example of showing how one can use longitudinal data to look at the relationship between chronic poverty and child health, it's important to point out here this does not demonstrate a causal relationship. And for policy work, we must focus on causal pathways. For child health, it's quite tricky to unravel causal pathways. For instance, an important question in this literature is, how do we unravel the causal path from childhood health to adult outcomes? One option here is using height as a proxy for early life and health circumstances. Health is cumulative, but adult height has been shown to have memory, to capture and reflect early life deprivation and hardship, which means it can alleviate the need for longitudinal data because your height is a record of your cumulative health experiences. Height has attracted considerable research interests in recent years due to increasing secular trends in height over the past two decades, which has shown that, on an aggregate level, differences in height are meaningful and have causal links to parental socioeconomic data, childhood nutrition, and access to clean water and sanitation during childhood. A related issue that is important to mention here is selective mortality. Whereas, for most countries, we see a very robust relationship between higher national income and lower child mortality and increased height, this is not true for African countries. For these countries, we don't see this relationship. Instead, higher child mortality rates are associated with increased height. The most plausible explanation for this anomaly in the cross-section country comparisons 
is that there might be some selective mortality at work here, which may shape height distributions differently in poor African countries. This might also explain why Africans are much taller than expected given their national incomes. What this explanation amounts to is arguing that the shortest individuals would likely be the most vulnerable, and in severe health environments where child survival is lower, it would often be the vulnerable who would be most likely to die. If the shortest children tend to be the ones who do not survive, then such selective mortality would increase the overall mean height. This can also be the reason why we find that a higher child mortality has a relationship with increased height in African countries instead of the normal relationship which we tend to see in other countries, the normal relationship being a negative relationship between mortality and height, namely that lower heights are associated with higher levels of mortality. Another relationship that we would like to estimate is the relationship between maternal disadvantage and child health, but the difficulty here is in estimating the causal relationship. Some of the problematic elements of that are distinguishing between the various influences on the child, including genetic, which is often called nature, the choices and behaviors of the mother, which would be called nurture, and then also the wider social and physical environment. As a very specific example, we can think of a regression on a child's health with a mother's education as the coefficient of interest, but without knowing the mother's abilities. If we don't have a variable to represent ability, we know that selection into education would be correlated with ability, and therefore we should be concerned that a share of the education coefficients would represent its relationship with ability. This means we don't have an unbiased estimate for the impact of a mother's education on child health. There are some useful solutions. First, there are natural experiments, which mimic the random assignment of controlled experiments. Then there are sibling or twin comparisons, which control for parental characteristics through these within household estimations. An example is, for instance, to use twins with different birth weights to compare the impact of weight on future outcomes. Factors like genetics and postnatal environments are the same for twins and that helps. Then finally there are instrumental variables, for example measuring the impact of education by using the opening of new universities and colleges as an instrument. The next theme to look at is the social determinants of child health, and we've touched upon this throughout the lecture. This slide is just a summary of several important pathways whereby the socioeconomic circumstances of the household affects the child's health. An important pathway is low quality caregiving in early education. We also have lack of access to clean water and adequate sanitation, pollutions and toxins, malnutrition, maternal alcohol abuse and fetal alcohol syndrome, disease and then also violent crime and trauma. These are all effects which are more likely to occur if the child lives in a household with poor socioeconomic circumstances. Poor households are more likely to not have adequate food, more likely to live next to a polluting factory, etc. Alcohol abuse is more likely for poor mothers. There's more exposure to disease and also, unfortunately, violent crime and war is more prevalent for households at the bottom of the income distribution. The 2007 Curry and Moretti paper showed that women who were low birth weight babies themselves were more likely to deliver low birth weight infants. They conducted this research using sister pairs based on California birth certificates from the 1960s to the 1990s. They also found that the effect was greater for women from low-income neighborhoods. Additionally, it has been shown that such health disadvantages associated with being born to a poor mother tend to worsen over the lifetime of the child. Why is this? Because children with poor initial health endowments receive poor postnatal investments, resulting in persistence or increase in initial health gaps. 
This also explains why the long-term impact of low birth weight is often bigger for poor kids. The 2003 Curry and Moretti study finds that an additional year of college education for women reduces the incidence of low birth weight. They identified this causal effect by using college openings as an instrument for education. They attributed improving education and the probability of healthy birth weights of their infants to three factors, timely health care, being married, and a lower likelihood of smoking. The graph here shows the findings of their study. They found that the incidence of low birth weight is more than three times higher amongst black high school dropout mothers than with white college educated mothers. Emphasizing the importance of intergenerational health effects, Janet Curry's paper considers four pathways, maternal behaviors, exposure to pollution, violence, and stress, access to family planning and health care services, and possible underlying health conditions. The slides that follow will discuss each of these in turn. First, we will look at maternal behavior. Evidence shows that healthy maternal behavior is better among the economically advantaged. In particular, we can consider the effect of smoking. RCTs have linked reductions in smoking among pregnant women to improved birth outcomes, example premature births. We know that smoking negatively impacts a newborn's health. Studies have compared birth weight of sibling pairs in which the mother smoked during one pregnancy and not the other and found that smoking at a mean number of 10 cigarettes per day increased the probability of low birth weight by 1.8 percentage points. Second, we will consider exposure to pollution, violence, and stress. This has been shown to influence newborn health. The 2011 Curry and Walker study showed that reduced auto emissions in the vicinity of toll plazas lowered the incidence of low birth weight by about 1% within two kilometers surrounding these toll plazas. These effects were identified using variations in pollution due to the introduction of electronic toll collection, Easy Pass, which greatly reduced both traffic congestion and vehicle emissions near highway toll plazas in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Pollution effects are part of the poverty and health story. A 2011 paper by Janet Curry shows that children born to less educated and minority mothers were more likely to be exposed to pollution in utero. And tragically, the 2010 ISER paper shows that hospitalization due to assault during pregnancy reduces the birth weight of a baby. It has been shown that exposure to a high level of the stress hormone cortisol in utero reduces IQ levels at age 7. We will now consider the third pathway for intergenerational health inequalities, access to health services and family planning. The 2009 Kearney and Levine paper has shown that the expansion of family planning services significantly reduced birth rates amongst the near poor for both teenagers and adult women. Causal effects have been identified by exploiting geographic variation and variation over time in access to and eligibility for family planning services. Additionally, the 2013 Bailey paper finds that children born in years and areas with access to subsidized family planning services had improved educational attainments and earnings. The last of these four intergenerational health inequality pathways is possible underlying health conditions. It has been established that disadvantaged women have worse underlying health issues due to a history of disadvantage. They tend to have higher exposure to disease because they live in crowded homes and use public transportation and have poor immune systems because they are less likely to be immunized and they thus face a higher likelihood of becoming ill from exposure to disease. Also, when poor women get ill, there are further disadvantages at play because they may not be able to stay home from work to recover and may have inadequate access to health care and thus struggle to obtain a diagnosis and treatment. 
Furthermore, the 2011 paper by Allman, Curry, and Herman showed that mothers in a high-diseased environment tend to have low birth weight babies, and their babies tend to have higher postnatal mortality rates. While intergenerational health inequalities are at the heart of this discussion on child health, we also wanted to consider evidence from low- and middle-income countries. This table is from a 2018 paper by Linda Richter and her co-authors exploring the social influences on child health at the age of two using four longitudinal data sets from low- and middle-income countries. The four countries are Brazil, India, the Philippines, and South Africa. The prevalence of stunting in two-year-old children ranged from 14% in Brazil to 68% in the Philippines. Maternal height and birth weight had strong and significant relationships with height for age at two years in all four sites. Three social environmental factors characterized as child circumstances, family socioeconomic status, and community facilities were also identified as playing a significant role in all sites. Family socioeconomic status was represented via maternal and paternal schooling. Community facilities were represented via toilet and water quality. And child circumstances was represented via birth order and the child dependency ratio. They found that biological pathways accounted for 59% of the total explained variance and the social environmental pathways accounted for 41%. Economists have paid less attention to childhood mental health. Mental health as a pathway has been neglected and requires more research. We know that poor mental health is more likely among the children of mothers who lack access to care, and we know that access to care problems are more frequent among disadvantaged women. The 2019 Ielan Burns study showed evidence from South Africa of intergenerational transmission of depression but also found that the effect is less severe in the presence of grants. Furthermore, the 2010 study by Curry, Stabile, Manavong, and Ruse found that mental health conditions had more serious consequences than asthma on high school students' performance and welfare use after they were 18 years old. Also, mental health is one of the most important determinants of the number of working days missed per year as an adult. Additionally, the 1999 paper by Curry and Madrian show that non-cognitive skills and soft skills that are affected by mental health problems have been linked to success in the labor market, so mental health also affects earnings in that way. We now look at work on the impact on child health from home visits by a community health worker testing interventions using the delivery model of the reputable Pailani Mentor Mother nonprofit organization. The study context is 24 communities in Cape Town townships, and the aim is to test the impact of community health worker, CHW, visits for infant and maternal health for women living with HIV during their pregnancies and 12 months after the birth of their babies. Twelve communities receive standard care access at government clinics and hospitals, which includes rapid HIV testing and receipt of results, as well as HIV care and prevention of transmission to the baby. This is the control group. Then the treatment group was 12 communities that received the intervention with community health care worker visits. The CHW antenatal messages are concerned with good maternal nutrition and preparing for breastfeeding, regular antenatal clinic attendance and danger signs, HIV testing, and prevention of mother-to-child transmission, and stopping alcohol use. In the postnatal period, the focus is on promoting breastfeeding and monitoring the growth of the baby, encouraging immunizations, prevention for HIV-exposed children, infant bonding, and ensuring that the mother was receiving the child grant. They found that women living with HIV in the intervention group were more likely to complete tasks to prevent vertical transmission, avoid birth-related medical complications, and have infants with healthy height-for-age measurements. Amongst the bigger group, 
also including women without HIV, they found that the intervention group was significantly more likely to use condoms consistently, breastfeed exclusively for six months, and have infants with healthy height-for-age measurements. Following the work of Pailani Mentor Mothers, a research team from Stellenbosch University ran a pilot-controlled trial aimed at modifying their delivery model to improve early access to care for pregnant women. In South Africa, early access to antenatal care is essential to test and start HIV-positive women on antiretroviral treatments. One in three pregnant women in South Africa is HIV-positive. Additionally, early access to antenatal care allows doctors and nurses to detect, monitor, and treat pregnancy danger signs and conditions, especially anemia and hypertension. The study took place in the Lawandal and Nomzano townships in the Western Cape, South Africa, in 2015. The broader context of this study is South Africa's poor performance in maternal mortality. At the time when we did this study, more than half of the pregnant women were accessing care late, and this contributed to maternal deaths. Note that the definition of late access to care is starting antenatal care after you have been pregnant for five months or more. The Thula Baba Box study was a package intervention, which means it delivered two interventions at the same time. This was based on the concept of Finnish baby boxes, which has a long tradition. All Finnish babies receive a box with basic goodies. This box with baby items was adapted to a South African context, which is, of course, a much lower resource environment than Finland. The total value of this box was 440 rand, which is approximately $30. It was intended as a new baby starter kit for mothers but research has shown it was important that the contents of the box should be aimed at the baby rather than the mother. The second part of this intervention was psychosocial support by the community health workers, CHWs. This represented supplemental services to standard clinical practice. The project had three CHWs and one project supervisor working in the study area, serving 50 pregnant women. They visited the women once every month. The goal of the CHW part of the intervention was to provide health information and psychosocial support. The pilot intervention showed a significant increase in early access to care and an increase in the number of visits by the pregnant women. The table here shows the results for two antenatal care indicators, namely going to the clinic often enough, which is here defined as four times or more, and going to the clinic early enough, which is defined as initiating care before five months gestational age. The table has two columns, showing the coefficients and significance levels of regressions, both with and without controls. The controls included age, education, population group, asset wealth being foreign, household size, first pregnancy, and finding out that they were pregnant from the CHW pregnancy test. The latter was opposed to the base case where women knew that they were pregnant but had not yet visited the clinic. We see an effect of just under 20 percentage points on frequency of visits, and this effect is significant at the 10% level. For women going to the clinic early, we have an approximately 30 percentage point effect, and this coefficient is significant at the 1% level. There was also some suggestion of a decreased likelihood of maternal depression increased intent to initiate and continue to exclusively breastfeed for six months and an increase in the birth weight of the babies. The overview of the literature we provide here shows strong evidence of intergenerational health inequalities with large differences in health at birth having important consequences for future outcomes. Consequently, policies addressing inequalities need to take into account factors that perpetuate poverty throughout entire lifespans. Specifically, they should not disregard mothers since mothers' health and life conditions impact children's health. It is vital to emphasize that child health inequality begins before birth. 
Additionally, there is also a need to improve the quality of evidence available for decision-making on child health in low- and middle-income countries. There is currently not enough evidence on child health in socioeconomic circumstances or enough evidence on cost-effective interventions. The 2015 study by Aaron Zur reports that of 49 economic evaluations of preventive interventions for children published in 2012, only 17 were relevant to LMIC. Of 25 economic evaluations of active pediatric treatments, only four targeted an LMIC population. It should, however, be borne in mind that cost-effectiveness studies in child health are a specialized field because of demands in measuring health-related quality of life in children. One cannot use standard adult measures for infants and neonates, and there are also differences by age group. There are a few things that governments can do to promote child health. First, they can invest in sexual and reproductive health through expanded access to family planning help by combating stigma against family planning in promoting female decision-making about family planning. The prenatal period should be targeted explicitly and access to antenatal care should be promoted. One option is to promote health worker home visits where workers provide information on health behavior, child care, and nutrition. These visits are effective, but they are quite expensive. Additionally, there are also programs to reduce violence against women and interventions to supplement the food and nutrition of pregnant mothers. Advances in pollution control may also help to improve infant and child health. Postnatal interventions include early education programs, income transfers or grants, and improved access to health care. A systematic review of efforts to improve access to care for children by Bright and her colleagues in 2017 shows that SMS reminders and proximity improve access. There is, however, a lack of good quality studies in LMICs. Finally, mental health issues are an important and large problem, especially among adolescents, and it is not clear how to address them. We need more evidence on mental health interventions targeting adolescents.